want to introduce uh, myself to everyone. I'm Sam Carlino. I wrote the book, uh, Colorado Carlino's Brothers. Uh, my grandfather, Pete Carlino, and great uncle Sam Carlino were pretty much Colorado's most notorious bootleggers during Prohibition. They gathered the most headlines and lived the, uh, uh, the most exciting of lives, uh, short lived as it was. They both were, were killed in 31. Uh, I have a lot of insight on this story that's never been told before. That's part of the reason why I wrote the book. And one of the big reasons why I wrote the book is I wanted my family's people to understand that there was a family behind this family, these two guys. And these guys were, uh, they were bad guys. You know, what they did, they, they weren't the best of guys. But they also had some, some good things about them because their kids turned out really good. My dad and his, six, and his five brothers, the six boys that moved to California, basically when their mother was given 24 hours notice to leave Denver alive with them in 1932, their mother died in 35, and these six boys basically raised themselves during the Depression. My dad was in World War II in the South Pacific. My uncles were building Liberty ships, and uh, four of the brothers were in the military, and not one of those brothers ever were involved with crime. And, California, they, they never got involved with this line of work. Um, they, they, they ended up being really productive people in their, their neighborhoods and uh, the grocery store they owned for 35 years and was, was really good for the community and they gave to charity and they raised great kids and that's part of the reason why I wanted people, because you never see that in whenever anything's ever written about. So the, that was kind of a selfish motivation for me to do that. But, I feel that I really have added a lot to, to this story, I'm sure. How many of, uh, of you guys have read Mountain Mafia? Okay, so pretty much almost everybody here. That focuses on about 1900 to 1993, about a 90-year span of organized crime in Colorado. <coughs> this really focuses just on the Carlinos from 22 to about 32. It's about a 10-year, 11-year span, their rise and their fall. and it, you're going to find a lot of details in this book that you're not going to, I've unearthed a lot of things. I made connections to New York that's never been made before. Uh, connections here in Pueblo that really put Pueblo on the map as a major mafia city because it was represented by a fellow um, named Nicolo Gentile who was a mafia boss back in uh, back east that was called in to, to do a mediate during a dispute. And that's all in the story here. It's, the, the details are just amazing. And I got to thank my, my friend Michael O'Hare, who flew out from Long Island to be here with us today. He really helped piece together two of the most important parts of the book. Between the two of us, we shared information. And by happenstance, we were able to find out the Pellegrino Scaglia connection with Carlinos, and also the Maranzano connection with Paul Dana. So that's in the book. And it's fascinating. That's something that, you know, it's, it's a really neat story. Uh, uh, kind of uh, sum it up, start it up from the beginning. My, my, uh, my grandmother was given 24 hours notice to leave, like I said, Colorado Alive up in Denver. She knew a lot of secrets. And my 15-year-old uh, Uncle Joe had sworn a vendetta against the killers who had killed his father. They respected her enough, to, and my dad and my grandfather enough to say, you know what, we're going to let you, you know, live, but you got to get out of here. You got to leave the state, and they did. And no vendetta was ever acted upon. Fifteen-year-old hothead kid, you know, didn't act on, on, on killing whoever took his father out. Maybe we have a good idea of who, but um, but the story really starts all the way back in Sicily when they came here in 1888. And they worked their way from New Orleans to Pueblo. Vito Carlino, the father of Pete and Sam, actually went back to Italy, to Sicily, and had two more children. And they came back for good in 1897. So initially came here in 1888, went back, had two more kids, came back 1897. They're 1898, they're here in Pueblo. Um, my uncle Charlie, great uncle Charlie, uh, was killed at the Baxter Bridge shootout. I'm sure you guys are aware of, of, of that story. Uh, he was the only Carlino boy to be born in the United States. All the rest of the of Vito's sons were, were born in Sicily. So these guys basically worked their way up through Pueblo. They, they were in Trinidad, 
and by 27 they're in Denver, and that's when things get really, I mean, they, they had quite a past year at Pueblo, but things got really crazy up in, in uh, Denver with allowing a federal undercover agent to infiltrate the gang and report back all the information that was going on in the family to the U.S. Attorney, who in turn was relaying that information to the mayor and the, um, the police chief, which were both crooked, Mayor Stapleton and Diamond Dick Reed. They were, they were as crooked as could be. And that's all in there. So Carr, the U.S. Attorney, chastises them in open court about how they did nothing when my grandfather's house was bombed and they knew about it. And at the Bootleggers Convention, when they were all free. So, you know, political favorites were, you know, headlines. I, I included a lot of headlines in this book just to show the impact of what, uh, how powerful this story was. And I think the, the, um, the what do you call it, uh, the headlines really tell the story. Uh, that's my grandfather Pete and his brother Sam. And that was the boss and underboss of, of uh, the Carlino group. Uh, they had connections. Their their friends were uh, the Malays. They were very close. They were intermarried. Uh, Sam, I mean Pete Carlino, my grandfather's wife, Jenny, was the sister to um, oh oh my God, Catherine 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 Reggio, who's Catherine Malay. So we were very close. In the Pueblo part of the story, the Malays and Carlinos are being attacked by the Danas and. There's a big uh, feud that erupts, and it's it's pretty amazing. There's there's a fellow named Paul Dana later on that that uh, it helps out. So this is a picture of uh, my grandmother and my dad and his brothers. This is my dad right here. This is my uncle Pete. That's Pete Jr. That's his father. And they're all gone. My dad was the last one to die in 2002, but I was able to get the good stories from, from what happened. I had always been told my whole life that my grandfather was, he, he, was, he died of pneumonia. And I was at the San Jose flea market, I was 18 years old, and I had a sausage shop out there with my dad. We'd make Italian sausage and chorizo stuff on weekend, on Friday night we sell it on the weekends. And I was handing out sausage samples to, uh, to the customers at the flea market and this, Old timer, this is 1985, I'm 18 years old. And in 1985, this 75 year old man comes up and, and he asks for a sample and give it to him. And he goes, Oh my God, this is the best sausage I've had since Thai Market. And I said, Well, this is Thai Market recipe. And he goes, Are You Carlino? I said, Yeah, who's your old man? And I said, uh, Sam. And he goes, Oh my God, I, I know your old man, I know all his brothers. You know, I, I used to work for your grandfather. And I'm like, Really? He goes, yeah, back in Colorado. And yeah, I remember when he was killed. I'm like, killed? I said, I had pneumonia. And he starts laughing at me. And he goes, I had pneumonia in my ass. And they shot him up. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, he died of lead poisoning. I'm like, oh, jeez. I realized that I'd you know, been told the wrong story all these years. And, and he goes, oh, your grandfather, he was the biggest bootlegger in Colorado. He owned that place. Oh, man. And he, He's telling me all this stuff, and uh, you know, I asked my dad on the way home, you know, catch him. Okay, Dad, uh, what, you know, what year did your uh, your mom die? She died in '35. Yeah. And what year did you guys come out? California. We came out in '32. And your dad? When did he die? He died in '31. And and how did he die? He died pneumonia. Yeah. I'm like, okay, doesn't want to talk about it. But my cousin, who was at the the, the sausage stand with me that day went home and told everybody, we're mafia. <laughs> the, the brothers were like, shh, shh, shh. no, we're not, we're not. <coughs> Anyways, that's how the cat got out of the bag. From 1985 on, the stories were starting to be shared, and I was able to take a lot of the, the stories, incorporate them with the facts that, that you guys know, and add a little bit of touch to it. At the end of each chapter, there's an author's perspective, and you, um, you're able to see my opinion on what it is. The rest of the book is pretty much the facts as, as we know them, uh, whether they're from FBI reports or Bureau of Investigation reports or newspapers or uh, police reports, whatever. Yeah. But I think my author's perspective kind of gives you an idea of where, where I'm thinking on this, where, 
when I write each chapter. So this is Pete Carlino in Sicily around 1888 and his older brother Stefano and their mother um, Closure. And that is Pete Carlino here in, in Pueblo. And that is his brother Sam Carlino and Josephine Piscopo. Josephine Piscopo's sister Anna Anna Episcopo married John Dan. And I don't know the exact reason for the feud between the Danas and Carlinos, but from what I heard at the family reunion in 85, this didn't help. For whatever reason, I think they were rival bootleggers anyways, because Prohibition started in 1916, or four years ahead of the rest of the country. So there was a, a conflict between the Danas and Carlinos early on. Then the, the murder started to happen, and that's when everything kind of went crazy in Pueblo. This is the first guy to be killed. He's a very, very important part of this, this whole, whole um, story. Pellegrino Scaglia, you probably know him as Antonio Viola, or Tony Viola. And he's the guy that gets killed on the, the grocery cart with the little boy and his daughter in the Mountain Mafia book. Well, he played a very, a, a much bigger role than people are aware of. He really was an important figure, and this was the catalyst for the, the Dana Carlino War, in which the next victim would be John Millay, who, who would be uh, killed. Uh, Pellegrino Scaglia's wife, Maria, is godmother to my Uncle Joe, my dad's older brother. That's how close the Carlino and Scaglias were, were involved. Uh, this fellow here, Nicola Gentile, was the Mafia boss that wrote the tell-all story in 1963. He was the first Mafia boss ever to lay out all these, these stories throughout his years between the teens and leading up all the way to, um, to the late 30s. Then he got deported to Sicily. And, but he told the book, you, you can't find the book in English. It's only in, available in Italian. It's called Vita di Capo Mafia. And if you know somebody who, who reads uh, Italian, you can, you can find the book on eBay every once in a while, if I'm not buying them up. <laughs> I've tried to corner the market on the, the Vita di Capo Mafia books. They're, they're pretty neat. Uh, this is John Malay Jr. And his father, John, was the next murder that occurred after Scaglia was killed. And now this, this war with the Danas and Carlinos is starting to escalate. And the, the members, the family members of uh, uh, friends and family of the Carlinos are starting to get killed. And it's, it's really getting pretty contentious between these two families. The next one, the next victim is Charlie Carlino. This is the only known photo of Charlie. He was Pete Carlino's youngest brother. He's the one that's killed at the Baxter Bridge shootout. And he went to the studio and they took a picture and then they did like this watercolor overlay of the photos. <laughs> Those chaps are hideous. <laughs> That's a good uh, my, uh, we've had this picture in the family for forever, but my uncle misremembered and told me that it was actually Steve Carlino, the Pete's oldest brother. And I got in contact about a week before the book was to be published with my cousin Karen Filosa out in New York, his granddaughter. And we were talking on the phone. I found her. I told her you know, I'm writing the book, and you know, I want to send her a copy, and this and that. And she says, "Oh, I've got this this great picture of uh, my grandfather, and he's in these chaps." I said, "That's your grandfather?" Because I have this picture. And I said, "That's that's Charlie?" Because I was told it was Steve. It's like, "Oh no, that's that's Charlie." And I went, "Oh." Perfect. So I was able to include it in the book, and I gave her the photo credits for it. But that was, that was the photo that we've had for all these years, and I just had it mislabeled that it, that it was Steve. It was actually Charlie, and I only had a couple days, but it ended up getting in the book. Uh, thank God. It, it was like right under the wire. It was the last photo to be submitted. So this is an interesting character, Ignacio Vaccaro. He's got got uh, uh, quite a, a past. Uh, he was one of the bodyguards and, and runners uh, for the Carlinos, and his wife, Pietrina, we call her Aunt Pat. He ends up getting killed, and Aunt Pat ends up marrying my grandmother's brother, and they moved to San Jose. So 
Very interesting story you're going to hear about, about Ignacio and, and that pen. Another colorful character. This is, we're going to call him Rudy Constantino. Uh, his real name is Pete Carlino, not this piece. Not my grandfather, Pete Carlino, but first cousins, Pete Carlino. He ends up getting mixed up in some business. He has to change his name, and he changes his name to Rudy Constantino. This is my dad, and he's the, the ring, ring boy at the wedding. And this is my cousin Josie. She just died in 2013. Her sister's still alive, 101. Goes bowling once a week. Sold real estate until she was 98. <coughs> so Sam Carlino and Rudy Constantino. The, when, when you see him, it's really Pete Carlin, but just we're going to call him Rudy because you're going to get confused with all the Pete's. So this is a, a great photo, and by now they're in Denver, and this is the Federal Boulevard house, 3357 Federal Boulevard. And that's my Uncle Joe, my dad, Uncle Steve, Pete's dad, Pete Jr., my Uncle Vic, my Uncle Chuck. And those are Pete's, the six boys of Pete. That's Pete Jr., Pete's dad, right there, in 1930, he's two years old. And what's, this is Dale Kearney. Now, Dale Kearney was a prohibition officer that was working this area down here in Aguilar and Trinidad, all the way up to Pueblo. He was the first federal agent ever to be killed in the line of duty in Colorado. So the federal government came down like a ton of bricks on this area, and they're trying to find who who killed him. Their first thought was it was Carlinos because they were the biggest bootlegging you know, family going on at that time. And he, uh, uh, U.S. Attorney Ralph Carr puts this fellow on the case. Is an Italian from Texas named Lawrence Baldessari. And he was the undercover federal agent that infiltrated the Carlino gang. And he helped bring down the entire Carlino Empire. I mean, it, it was amazing. This guy is a hero. You know, he, he's the guy that was in the, the, the mix of things. With, I mean, he could have been killed at any moment. And he was relaying all the Carlinos movements you know, to the, the U.S. Attorney, which was in turn being relayed to the police. It was the crooked police chief and crooked mayor, which got him in trouble, too. This is a, one of the most significant photos really should be in a museum because it's the only picture that gathers all these characters at one time. No, there's, I've never seen a photo like this before where it gets everyone. This is Pete Carlino here, my grandfather. This is Joe Roma. You probably recognize the name Joe Roma from, from Denver. He was the boss. Okay. This fellow here, Paul Dana, he ends up moving to New York and living at Salvatore Maranzano's brother's house at 93 Truxton Street important figure, ends up being one of the oldest Mafia members ever at 103. Lucchese crime family. Yeah. And that's part of the Lucchese crime family. Have you ever seen Goodfellas? That's the Lucchese crime family, so he was a soldier in that family. The fellow with his arm around Pete is John Cobb. He was the, the, uh, the mayor of Trinidad in the early 60s. Okay. This is Gaetano Dana, <coughs> and that's his brother. Next to him is Jimmy Canzanari. Right not too long after this picture is taken, John Caw and Jimmy Canzanari are gunned down. Caw survives, he's shot, but he's wounded and he plays dead. Canzanari dies. And uh, Paul Dana moves to New York. So this is a real significant picture, it's real grainy. Uh, but this is taken up in Denver in January of 1931. <coughs> and this is Raphael Small Dome. He is the father to the Small Dome brothers that you guys are all familiar with. Clyde, Eugene, Clarence, Chauncey, Ralph Jr. You've never seen any picture like this before. This is in the book as well. So this is uh, my Uncle Dan Reggio. My great uncle Sam Carlino. There's Rudy Constantino. He keeps showing up. And Joe Petralia. Joe Petralia is our cousin, who came from from Florida, and he's going to play a really, really important part in this whole whole mess. Here's another photo uh, taken at the same time. 
Ralph Smalldome, the old man, his son, the little boy on Rudy's lap, Joe Petrelia, and Sam Carlino. They're with a with their the little rum truck there. So in in January of '31, they had a bootleggers convention that was raging, and Lawrence Paul Lasseri, the undercover agent, had informed the police, uh, the, the, um, the attorney, uh, the, the attorney, U.S. Attorney Ralph Carr, who in turn told the police. So they got ready to, to raid this this restaurant, the Paul Marte restaurant, and Joe Roma, who was supposed to be there, and the Small Dome Brothers are both missing when these guys raid. I think they got tipped off by the police because there's a report later on that, that's, that's written that the police were on the Small Dome and Roma payroll. So that's why they weren't at the, at the meeting. So not too long after that, Pete gets shot at. He's fearing for his life. He goes on the run. The undercover agent takes him to Omaha, and in the meantime, his house gets blown up. Well, the Denver Post immediately assumed that it was bootleg rivals. The police went immediately after all the Carlino game, Joe Petralia, uh, Dan Coletti, Chris McCurry, Joe Ferraro, Sam Carlino, Pete Carlino, Pete's missing. Because they knew that it was an inside job because the undercover agent was there the whole time when they were planning it. And he told everyone exactly, you know, who to find. That's the house that was on 3357 Federal Boulevard. Chris McCurry, they called him Dynamite Chris, did such an excellent job. Look at the minimal damage to the adjacent houses. That house came down in its footprint. I mean, they, they had bombs set on three levels of the house. It terrorized the whole neighborhood. Bricks flew for blocks. But these houses pretty much stayed intact. It was like a, a Vegas hotel, you know, being imploded, coming right down on its footprint. It's crazy. <clears throat> so everyone's seen these pictures. These are in all the books or in the newspaper and the Denver Post pictures. Nobody has seen this. That's what the house looked like before the explosion. And that's my dad and his brothers, and that's Pete sitting on the stoop. And the, the neighbors are the Leonettis right next door. That was that house that you saw. Right there. That's that house. That's Sam. He ends up um, getting uh, killed. And that's a picture of his house on 33rd Avenue in, uh, in Denver. And that's the actual, I bought this actual picture online back in 2010 for $12. The real picture that was used in the newspaper with a stamp on the back and the description of what it was. They showed this in the newspaper. This is the escape route that Bruno Moro took to an awaiting car across the, the way. And that's my Aunt Josie. So uh, my Aunt Pat, I told you earlier, there's a story about her husband, Ignacio Vaccaro, that you'll read about. And this is uh, cousin Charlotte. And this is a police detective that is escorting them for, from her house right after Sam's been killed. They, they were present at the time that Sam was murdered. So in the meantime, Pete's off. He's recruiting gang to come back to New York, or to, um, he's on his way to New York, but he's recruiting the gang to invade Denver. And uh, kids would do a little hot water with, with the mafia back in New York because they're trying to, you know, quell all this infighting. And here he's making headlines saying that he's, he's it, at all cost and of money or, or lives, he's going to take Denver back. So he comes back. They end up capturing him. That's Pete. Uh, he's caught at the Guatemondo Ranch. Uh, so Charlie Guatemondo lived outside the uh, bubble here. And he, uh, he's captured. And he, he's brought up to Denver. And Joe Roma bails him out. And there's a whole story about this that is not just what you've read in Mountain Mafia. There is a whole other part of the story. Thanks to, to Mike again for the two of us piecing this thing out. He, I found a, a very important newspaper article that actually had the fiscal paper, I would own the paper from back in 31. 
and Michael made the connection with the Paul Dana Maranzano thing with the 93 Truxton Street, where I believe that when he went back to New York, he most likely stayed. Can't prove it, but this guy, Paul Dana, who would, gave alibi testimony for him, was living at the boss of bosses' brother's house in Brooklyn. That's pretty, pretty close. This is the, um, the document that shows who put up the bail bond. So Joe Cefalu and Cavalieri and, and Joe Roma are the ones that all put together. Here's Pete's signature. And so not long after that, Pete's killed. And everyone says, well, like uh, all suggests in her book, maybe, you know, Roma bailed him out just so he could kill him. That wasn't the case. Maranzano was the one most likely that gave this the, the okay to kill him. He, for two reasons. Because he allowed a federal un undercover agent into the family, and also for another reason. Come on in. Uh, another reason was because he had been tracked all the way back to New York, and it was documented in this, this uh, June 24th, 1931, Rocky Mountain News uh, article, which really blew everything. I mean, that is, is it, I put that entire article in its its uh, entirety in there, and it's something that you really you got to see. It's great. So this time, Pete's dead. Times are tough for the family. My uncle Joe has to rely on bare knuckle brawls up in Denver, and my uncle Vic was doing the. Uh, he was taking the bets. That's how they're making extra money to make ends meet. My dad's seven years old selling newspapers on the street. They had no money. They were absolutely broke. Uh, that's my grandmother, um, Jenny Reggio uh, Carlino. And you know, things are, are tough. The trial is coming up on for Bruno Morrow because he's the one that, that shot Sam. And Josie had moved her family to San Diego. And she gets extradited back to testify. And it's, it's quite uh, an ordeal. I, I write about all the details on how she's extradited and what it took to get the state of California to release her to, to Colorado, which is very interesting. There's a bunch of firsts that's never happened before. This is her coming out of the, um, the mausoleum where she visited her husband, um, you know, his grave. And this is a picture of my dad and his brothers, and that's the 1929 Dodge Senior sedan that they drove in from Colorado all the way out to California. They escaped. And these are the trunks that helped with basically the downfall to the family back when the bombing occurred. The undercover agent, Lawrence Baldessari, had told the police, go to Joe Ferraro's house around the corner, and you're going to find the Carlino heirlooms hidden in these two trunks. Sure enough, the police go there, they open the trunks, and there's all the family photos and the china and you know every every heirloom that the Carlinos owned were in these two trucks. I own this one, and my cousin Susan has this one here. And with those trucks trunks made the trip in that, that car all the way over. This one was came over from Sicily in the 1800s. So it made the trip across the ocean. These are some of the heirlooms that were in there. The statue of St. Therese and uh, 1790s, uh, an Italian violin made in the 1790s. It's a Stradivarius copy. My cousin owns that. So that is basically the, the story in a nutshell. I don't want to give everything away.